Hey everyone, um, I'm Milmaz. Today I'll be talking about advanced editor scripting. Thank you all for waking up early this morning and making it here after the party. Um, let's get started. Is my screen up there? Yes, beautiful. Um, so editor scripting is one of my passions, one of the things I like to do more than anything else in Unity, uh, which is why I want to share with you the things I learned along the way. And um, I've been working with Unity for about six years and maybe doing editor scripting for about four years. But um, I actually would like to know how many people in the audience have done editor scripting before. If I could get a show of hands, any kind of editor scripting. Beautiful, so quite a few of you. And uh, how many of you had the chance to go to the intro to editor scripting session last year uh, at Unite 11? Just a few people. Um, that's, that's a bit sad because it was a really good introduction session given by uh, Tim Cooper and Sean White from Unity Technologies where they went over the fundamentals of editor scripting, such as writing uh, inspector editors and editor windows. And they went into uh, an in-depth example for each of those and then were able to teach some of the more fundamental editor APIs through them. Uh, I'm not going to go over what they went over, uh, but there will be some overlap, so uh, you won't be missing out too much. I just got to start my timer. OK. So in last year's intro uh, session, they talked about inspector editors, editor windows, which are the two basic types of editor tools that you can write. And they talked about how do you serialize object and property, and how, why that is the proper way to access your um, object's properties uh, in the editor. So you can support multi-editing and a lot of other things, and undo as well. And they talked about drag and drop. They talked about handles to draw on the scene view. And they talked about multi-object editing, and, and a few more things. Um, in this talk, though, to go over some of the more advanced editor scripting topics, I'm dividing editor tools into the five following categories. So we got workflow assistance and automation, which we have quite a few examples for, asset processing, build pipeline customization, uh, optimization, and the last category that I really want to start with, but, I, but I'm going to start with the workflow one uh, just for fun. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these categories, and then we're going to look at an example, uh, a production example of, for each one, and then we're going to go into the code and see what, what's it doing behind the scenes. And at any point, you can ask questions. Um, but it's probably best if you hold your questions, un um, not until the end of the talk, but until the end of each category, so we can just go through them all together. Um, so starting with workflow assistance, our first example uh, is from a game that I worked on recently called Box Plots. Um, and my right hand is a little injured, so I'm going to be slow typing some code, so please don't get upset. And just to give you a quick uh, look at what the game plays like so we can see what the editor tool actually allows us to do. is uh, It's a Sokoban game where you push blocks onto the marked tiles, uh, tiles marked with X, which are the goal tiles. And when you do this for all the blocks in the scene, you win the level. So this is the idea. And in this game, there are 28 levels like this. Uh, along with some tangram levels. And we just needed to do this in about 13 weeks, so we needed something that could let us create levels fast and iterate over them. So what we could have done is we could have just exposed the values of each tile in the grid, uh, whether it's occupied, what it's occupied by, whether it's navigable or if it's a goal tile, et cetera, in the inspector, just via a, a serialized um, instance of class arrays, um, sorry, an array of instance classes and then we could just set the values there. But then we wouldn't be able to, we would have to look at those values and infer the state of the, of, of the level instead of being able to visually see it. So uh, what I did is I wrote a very tiny editor script that lets us see what the grid structure of the level is like. Uh, and this is how I actually set up the level. So the scene is pretty much just static geometry. Uh, so these three pieces make up the scene. And then the things that I move around are the only dynamic geometry. And basically what we do is I go in top-down orthographic view. And this is the, the working state of the grid, but it's very easy to actually create it from scratch. So that's what I will do. I have a little custom inspector over here. It's nothing too fancy. Um, we got 18, uh, sorry, 12 tiles by 8 tiles. And we hit Create Grid, and we get a blank new grid. As you can see, there's nothing, none of the tiles are different from each other. And uh, what I start with doing is I just mark the goal tile. So I can, I can hit uh, down on my mouse button to select any tile, which is indicated by this um, white cross. 
and then I have some key shortcuts that can toggle uh, certain states of the tile. So I can hit G to set these as goal tiles. I can use my arrow keys to navigate between them. And uh, for sections of the level that the player should not be able to travel on, I can just hit E to um, disable those tiles so nothing can move in them. So this is usually what I do. And then uh, after I've done that, I let the grid know that which occupants start at which tile position. So I hit S, and you see a little red cross come on. And if I click on a, what I call an occupant, which is just anything that kind of moves around the grid and occupies a tile, that it goes ahead and selects it. And if I look in the perspective view, uh, you can see this is what it looks like. And I just go ahead and do this for all the other occupants. Uh, and this is actually one part of this that could be automated, right? So we could just do a ray cast down from each tile position a little up and find the collider and find the component on it and attach ourselves to it. Uh, but it's basically when you're making editor tools and you, that's not all you do. I mean, I was just the one developer on the team and I was developing the game along with making these kinds of tools to help me along the way. It's kind of a trade-off between how much time you spend on your tools uh, and how much time you, you save by using those tools. Um, I think the one thing I'm missing, if I could hide this guy somehow, nope. Anyways, uh, the one thing I'm missing is I need to specify the player. And again, a shortcoming of my script is that it can't pick the player because of some hierarchy issues. So what I do there is I go into the selected tile section, and uh, I select this tile. If I could, I can't. Let's see. OK. And I just drag the player in. And I think now our level should be playable like before. Although I did all this in play mode, didn't I? Wonderful. Um, Still seems to work, so it's fine. So this is a very, very basic editor script. Uh, we're going to go on to more advanced stuff later on, but I think it's a good start. Uh, and this is just one script, so let's go in and take a look at what it does. Um, any questions so far? Anything you think I didn't explain properly? Anything confusing? No? OK. So we have a grid class that kind of just keeps all the tiles in an, in an array. That's basically what it does. And all the tiles just have some properties. Um, the properties they have are whether they're enabled, whether they're navigable, whether it's a goal tile, if it's occupied by something, and just a string special data for um, setting up some variant gameplays. And um, this script is only 250 lines long. It's not that long at all. It didn't take long to write. So, But just the amount of flexibility um, and the visual aid it gives you and the speed it gives you to develop these levels is just mind-blowing. So I think everyone should invest some time in learning how to do editor scripting and write some tools specific to their use case. Um, so one more disclaimer is that uh, against the best practice, I didn't use much serialized object and property in this one, which you should do. So you'll see some not so great code in here, uh, but I think you'll, get, you'll understand the kind of things I'm trying to show. So basically, on Inspector GUI, uh, we just draw the default inspector that the, the inspector would have drawn anyway, which you see here at the top, up until tile width, uh, up until show grid. And after that, uh, we just leave a little bit of space and just draw a couple toggles to show and lock the grid in case um, we need to hide the grid or prevent uh, from accidental manipulation of it, which I guess show grid doesn't work, right? Uh, if we lock the grid, though, these controls become disabled. Uh, which we do that by setting GUI.enabled. And then we have a couple foldouts where we show the Create section and the um, Selected Tile section. And basically, it's just drawing a bunch of fields. Uh, the interesting part to me is the actual being able to actually manipulate the, the grid in the scene. And that part comes by looking at events. Uh, so let's find where that is. OK, in on scene GUI, if, not, if you know, we've set up everything correctly, and if our selected tile is on, we first deal with our selected tile, the one that glows when you uh, go ahead and select it. Here we go. You can see it. Um, we check for some key presses, such as E and N and S, for setting enabled, uh, navigable, goal tile, uh, selection mode, etc. And then we use the handle utility class so that we can actually grab the mouse clicks and when there is a mouse button down, we can um, call pick game object. Let's see where that is. Here it is, handle utility.pick game object. And then it goes ahead and, and picks the first game object it hits. 
Um, it's not exactly like a physics.raycast call, so it's not looking for colliders, uh, which might throw you off. <clears throat> and then if the game object that we hit has a occupant component on it, then we go ahead and grab it and say, this tile is occupied by this occupant. And then after we've handled the selected tile, we go and just draw all the other tiles. And um, that's about it. There's just some extra code for drawing the little spheres that indicate that there's an occupant there, and so on. Um, let's move on. Uh, there's a tiny, tiny script, uh, level navigator, that I wrote uh, in this one. OK, I got to open another project for this one. Um, OK, so as I said, in this game, there are about 28 levels, which you can see here. And they're organized in a levels folder with their level name and all the assets for that level going in that folder. Um, and here you can see it in the project view. OK. And sometimes uh, a lot of the stuff in the levels are prefabbed, which means I can just modify the prefab and apply its changes to all the levels. But there is some stuff. Uh, that you can't prefab that easily, so you have to go and make a change in every level, or you have to go and inspect every level to make sure that something you might have forgotten before, you can go and check it in. Uh, and instead of having to go through all of them one by one and load them up, um, just wrote a very tiny um, editor window, which is not impressive in itself, but it uses a very key uh, editor API, which is why I want to show it to you. Um, I usually just dock it below my project view. And then I just hit the next and previous buttons to just go through each scene. Uh, so if we take a look at that tiny editor script, level navigator, um, on enable, which is when that editor window gets created, we call asset database .get all asset paths. And this is a wonderful, wonderful a API call, which gives you all the paths of all the assets that you have in your project. And, um, but it takes a while. Uh, it can take up to like two seconds, I think. But it's not a big problem if you're just bringing a window up and you're, it's only a one-time uh, cost to you. But once you get all those paths, then you can go through them. And what I do is I find everything that ends with .unity, which means it's a scene file. And then I just add it to a list. And once I do that, um, I also grab my current scene, which I do with editor application .current scene. And then whenever I hit the next or previous buttons, I just um, parse the string to the scene change it to an integer, add or subtract one to it, and then change it back to a string and load it. And to load a scene uh, through an editor script, you call editor application.open scene, and you give it the scene path. Let's go back to our presentation project. Oh, my timer's gone. Oh, well. Let's start it again. OK, let's move on to asset post-processing. But before that, does anyone have any questions about the workflow assistance uh, editor tools? There were a couple more that I want to show, if we have time near the end, uh, of a couple tools that I saw in the asset store that were extremely cool for workflow. But uh, we'll get to those if we have time. Uh, so for asset processing, um, if you're in importing a lot of textures or a lot of uh, models into your project, and you keep finding that you have to modify them in one way or another. Like, you know, the default scale factor is 0.01. You want to set that to 0.1 for all your models. Uh, now it's a bit easier, now that you can do multi-object uh, editing and select all those assets and set those values. But there might be some times where you know that every asset that goes into a specific folder or has a specific name needs to have some specific import uh, options applied to it. So let's take a look at an asset post-processor. And this was something I wrote a way, way back, and I don't really use it anymore because it's not very flexible, but I think it'll get the idea across, is that I wrote a model asset post processor, uh, deriving from asset post processor, that just looks at the name and sees if there are any uh, prefixes, sorry, that's actually a suffix, uh, if there are any suffixes that say something like underscore RB, underscore collider, et cetera, and just adds those things right away to the model. Um, so you get an on post process model call from the editor API. And then you get the game object associated with it. And then you can go ahead and, and process it any way you like. Um, a better way to do this now is you can, use, um, you can add user data to your model objects. Um, 
to your 3D model files in programs like 3ds Max, and you can get that at import time and use that instead of using the name of the object, which is much better. Uh, but basically, we check if there is a collider prefix, such as underscore collider. And if it, if it is, if it's something like underscore collider box, then we add a box collider. We add a sphere collider, add rigid bodies, et cetera. And I want to show it to you in, um, in action. We have the models folder here. We have simple plane Z, which if we scroll all the way to the bottom, you see it only has a mesh filter and a mesh renderer. Uh, so if I duplicate this guy and add, underscore collider, let's say sphere, and then underscore RB. Uh, now at the bottom, we have a sphere collider on it and a rigid body on it automatically. So this is something you can do. But again, don't use the name. Use user data if you're able to, or if the program that you're using is the supports user data. Uh, you can also post-process textures. You can actually post-process any kind of asset that comes into Unity. But um, textures is another good one. And actually, another good one is audio, because I think we still can't uh, do multi-object editing on audio assets. For, I don't know why. But if that's wrong, feel free to correct me. Uh, but let's do it on textures. And you could do this, instead of by name, you could do this by folder, for example, because I don't think you can pass any user data with textures. Um, so I have a source textures folder. And this is stuff that I'm not going to directly use in my game, but it's uh, textures that I might want to refer to later on in production to see where my textures came from. So I don't want any of these to be compressed, because when you bring a texture into Unity, the default setting uh, for the compression is compressed, right? And that can, if you're on iOS platform, that can just, at build time, give you massive wait times uh, due to how long PVR compression takes. So you want to set that uh, compression mode. You want to set it to GUI um, import mode, and then set the compression to true color. Uh, so let's bring a texture in. Go. OK, we have a banana texture here. If we bring it in anywhere, we get the default import settings, texture type texture, and then format is compressed. If we bring it into the source textures folder, if this works, we get texture type GUI and uh, format true color. Let's take a look at how that's done. And it's, it's pretty similar. So like the model post-processor, where we get an on-post-process model call with the texture uh, post-processor, we get the on-pre-process texture call. And if we, check, we just check the asset path to see if it starts with the folder that we're targeting uh, for the custom import settings. And then we just go ahead and cast the asset importer to a texture importer so we can set its settings, create a new texture importer settings instance, read the current settings, and then modify them, and then set them back. And then that's about it. So pretty simple. Uh, the next category is build pipeline customization. And uh, this is very useful if you need to make slightly different builds that go to different places. Uh, for example, uh, I recently worked on a project where we had one monolithic app in one Unity project. But the client wanted to actually divide it into separate different apps. But I didn't want to maintain three, four different Unity projects for it, because all, most of the assets were shared. Most of the code was shared, uh, but there were just little tweaks along the way. So I just wrote a little editor window, if I can bring it up. Here it is. And like I said, all these tools that I write are pretty much hack jobs. They can be improved a ton, and we could even go over how they can be improved, and we might even be able to code some of them in. Um, what we do here is instead of using the build settings window, where we can just specify one list of scenes that you can use to make a build, and you have to set your platform every time, and so on. Uh, you can do it for multiple build configurations. So you just say, add build configuration. And you can say, uh, press build, for example. right? And then you can hit add scene, and choose very specific scenes, if you want to, uh, to add to this build. And then you would only build that. Now, in the actual code for this class, uh, I did a bunch of hard coding. It's not good, but that's what did it for me at the time. But uh, I'd actually eventually like to add this functionality to the editor window itself. So let's take a quick look. As you see, there's a Verify button here. And uh, it doesn't do anything right now. But what that was for is you might have some special requirements in place for your project state. 
before you can actually make that build, such as, oh, make sure this asset is in this folder, and make sure to take this asset out of the resources folder, because it's not used, and it will get included in the build otherwise. And um, if you go to verify build configuration, right now I just do an early out for this demo, but uh, you can see that if my build configuration name was full app, then check these things. And if it was costume chest, then check, check, check that these assets are in these places. But again, this wouldn't be that much work to actually expose into the editor window, where you can make a list of things saying, you know, this asset belongs here. And one thing to keep in mind when you're referencing assets is that you don't want to reference them by path. You want to reference them by their GUID. Uh, so that would be one thing to watch out for. Uh, I actually want to build one of these. Uh, let's do this, because it will come in handy later. And the build button goes ahead and builds it uh, using the build pipeline that build player call. Uh, but that is only available in Pro, which doesn't mean you can't use something like this in Unity free. You can. You would just have to go and uh, hit, um, after your script would change all these settings, you just have to hit build here. You, you just can't call it from code. Um, so we had our build. Uh, what happened during the build process right before it is after verifying that everything is in the correct place, um, we do a bunch of things. This was an iOS project. So we set the target device, whether it's iPad, iPhone. And for some different builds, we actually had different ones. But right now, all these are iPad only. And then you can set the resolution, set the bundle identifier, because they were all supposed to be released as different apps. And you can set the display name to be shown on the home screen, uh, and so on. And then you go ahead. You take those scenes that you specified in the build window and give them as an array to build pipeline that build player right here. And then you give it the build path where you want to build it. Uh, you want to tell which target to build for. And then if you have any specific build options, you can specify them here. Um, one good thing that this allowed me to do is that right here, you'll see I concatenate two build path uh, the date time. So anytime I make a build through this system, I know which day I did it on. And you could even append hours and minutes and seconds to this thing. So as you keep making builds, it, you don't keep overriding it. Uh, you keep making new builds, and you can go back to the previous builds pretty easily. OK, we're going to move on to optimization. Uh, any questions? Yes. By the way, do we have any microphones in the room yet? Are you going to get one? OK. Can you hold on a second? Who was it? Uh, it was over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, doing those builds. Wouldn't be a great idea to, to tag the builds on a source control system at that stage when you build? I'm so, sorry, I couldn't quite understand. With Windows builds, you said? No, when you do the new folder for building, wouldn't that be a great opportunity to also tag that um, in source revision control system? Do you have any experience how difficult it would be to implement such stuff? To, to put the build uh, into source control system, is that what you said? Or are you talking about just the configuration that we set up in that window, source control that? Is that what you're saying? I was just thinking if you use source control, that when you build, you tag, mm -hmm. so you have the source code in your revision control system tag that, you know, ah, uh, this date had it, that Which is this, is this build, right, exactly. So you can match commit specific commits to specific builds, right? Yes. yes. Absolutely, it would be a good idea. Any other questions right there? So on, uh, for building, say, for iOS, you might need to include extra frameworks. Is there a way of doing that from uh, the build processor? Right. So one thing you can do is, I believe, in plugins iOS folder. Uh, I don't have an iOS folder here. But uh, if you include you know, custom frameworks in there, you can, um, it will automatically get included. And what you can do is you can move those out to a, to a temporary folder if you're not building for iOS, which actually, I think Unity does that automatically. If I remember correctly, it won't include iOS uh, bundles in other types of builds anyways. So you just put it there, and it will get included. If you mean uh, stuff like the kind of frameworks you can include in Xcode that just come with the iOS SDK, um, in that case, I think you need a build post processor where the build happens, and then you run the post process build player code, which I might have here. 
thanks to Prime31. Let's see. Um, I actually don't. So this, I just put this project together from assets of several different projects, but I do have it in another project where you just post-process it, and then you do some Apple script or, or you know, some other language to just inject that stuff into your Xcode project. That's definitely doable. If there are no other questions, I'll move on. OK. So you can also use editor tools for optimization purposes, right? And uh, I came across one from the asset store called Resource Checker by Hand Circus, which I believe they made Ron uh, Rolando 1 and 2, and then they have a new game. Um, I should have it here. In fact, I should be able to bring it up here. Beautiful. So we have the box plots level 004 loaded up. And you, when you bring up this resource checker, it will show you all the textures, materials, and meshes that are used in your, by, in your scene right now. And um, I've written a couple scripts that did something like this, but they would just print it to the console. They put it in a nice editor window where you can actually see which texture is being used by what game object and how many game objects is referencing and so on. So you can see number zero is being referenced by 18 game objects. And uh, you can go to the materials and meshes. And you can see that this is very, a very on the surface kind of thing, but it gives you a good idea of what's being used because sometimes it's very easy to forget stuff in your hierarchy that might be referencing a 2048 by 2048 texture and just kind of blows up your scene's memory size, right? So this is very useful. Um, one other thing I had to do a while back, luckily you don't have to do this anymore, is uh, back in Unity 3.2 something, the included PVR texture tool wasn't that great. And um, the guy who owns Toxic Blob, I can't remember his name, I think it's Jamie, did a great blog post on how to download the PVR text tool from the Image Text website and then use that yourself to create higher quality uh, PVRs, still the same size, just much better looking. So uh, he had a bit of code that did that, and I turned that into a menu item that could actually do that for me semi-automatically. Um, so let's see if we can actually do that. Um, we go, I wonder what this does. I don't remember. Oh, here it is. OK, so we have this 256 by 256 texture. Uh, in Unity 3.5, 3, and, and Unity 4, the PVR compressor, compressor is good. I think there's still some uh, debate going on there, but it's, oh, pretty much good. And if we compress it and set uh, compress on import, hopefully this won't take long. Oh, we're in uh, PC build. That's fine. Um, it'll go ahead and compress it. But then what you can do is you select your texture and then go to Window, create high quality PVR, and then does a little process, calls out to the external executable, and then gives you back the PVR file which you can't set any import settings on because it's the final PVR format that you're going to be using, but you can do it. And let's take a look at how this does the job. Um, so we have different paths for the executable on Mac and Windows. Um, we have a list of arguments that we pass to the executable. And actually, right now, it's sitting on my desktop. Um, PVR, text tool, and then the command line version. And they have different versions for Macs, Linux, Windows, et cetera. Um, when we hit the menu item, uh, this static method will get called. We check the platform. We set the pass accordingly. We get a filtered selection of the objects that are selected in our project right now, and we're only asking for texture 2Ds. If there are none, we quit. If there are some for each one, we first display a cancelable progress bar. And then um, we figure out a bunch of things, such as the texture path in the project, and then we convert that to an OS texture path. And finally, we go here and we create a new process. And as the file name, we set the file name of that executable. And then we tell it uh, a couple of things. This is your working directory. You should redirect standard error and standard output so we can read it back. Actually, when we ran that tool in the console, we get the standard error output from that tool in the console. So in case something goes wrong, in case you pass it a PSD file, for example, and, and it craps out, then you, you know why it failed. Uh, and then you give it the arguments. You start it, and then you wait for it to exit. And this kind of breaks the cancelable progress bar thing, because this is a blocking call. Um, but then you wait for it. It's done. And then you dispose the process. And then you copy the texture file back into the project. And now you have a better looking PVR texture if this was 2010. Um, so that's that. Um, another thing is, you know how you can make builds from the build menu? 
and then in the edited log, you'll get a, an output of the, of the assets that were included in your build. So if we open up the editor log, and if we scroll up, 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 up a bunch of times, we'll eventually get to this section that says, here are the assets that I included in your build, right? And I don't like to do this thing, do this hunt every time I make a build. So what I do is with that build window thing that I showed you, um, if I can find where I made that build, should be in Unite 12. And as you can see, it has the, if we could scale this, it has a date on it, like we said. Today's the 24th. If I go to the dot app, there is a build.log file there. And let's open this with text edit. It, it just kind of looks at the editor log, find the last, finds the last instance of that block that says what assets were used in the build process, and then you can just get a good reading of what was included, and you can say, ah, well, I don't really use this tutorial texture. It shouldn't have been included. Let me go figure out why it was included. I guess a better idea would be to take this data and show it in the console, perhaps. It might be a bit unwieldy, or you could show it in a custom editor window that would then let you go and select that texture and find its references. You could do all sorts of things. You could do, you could go crazy. So there is a certain point where if you're actually making games, where you have to stop and make the game instead of making editor tools, which is way more fun for me. OK, we got to the good, good part. So um, one example I want to show for the just for fun category is pixel placement stress ball, which is this guy. So when you're working on a pretty stressful client project and you just got a call and they pissed you off, you launch this guy up and you play around with it. So it serves no point towards productivity or anything, but if it helps you get through the day, then it's good, isn't it? And then um, the next one is a web window, and this is a special one because I'm going to try to live code it, and it might go horribly wrong. Um, but let's see if this works. So what we're going to do is you guys all know the asset store. Uh, we're going to try and take the asset store and turn it into a web browser inside of Unity, uh, which we can't enter a URL here or go to Google or do anything here, right? But wouldn't it be cool if you could just pop up the documentation in a window inside of Unity and dock it, and then any time you want to search for something, you just hit a button, type something, and just documentation just pops up. Would be great. Um, so let's give it a shot. So what we're going to do is, um, so very few of you went to last year's intro to editor scripting session, but Sean White there said a very important thing. He said, uh, he said these words. He said, through the magic of reflection, you can do anything. You can achieve anything, I think he said. And I think that should be our, our mantra. That should be our religion, that through the magic of reflection, we can do anything we want in the editor. Uh, so that's what we're going to do, which, oh, geez, uh, I haven't launched VMware. Let's do this. I'm going to need to um, run a DLL, .NET DLLD compiler on Windows, so that, which is why I need VMware. Um, so yeah, thank you. While this is booting up, um, let's take a look at where the assemblies that are used for the editor and the engine come from. Uh, so if you go to our Unity installation folder, sometime this year. OK, so inside the, this is on Windows, it might be a bit easier to find. But if you go inside the package contents of the Unity application under Frameworks Managed, you could find the Unity Editor DLL and the Unity Engine.dll. And then you can copy these over if you have a Windows machine. I don't know of any .NET DLL uh, decompilers that run on Mac. One thing I was able to do is the .NET Reflector. Uh, you can actually run that through Mono. So you can, in the, in the command line, you can type Mono and then give the executable name. It will actually run OK on Mac, but uh, best to do it on Windows. Uh, and this one, JetBrains.peak, is actually free. So that's what I would recommend that you use, and it works great. So let's launch that up. You just copy those DLLs out. I just need the editor one for now. And then we can open them up and look inside and see actually quite a bit of how the editor functions, which is a great, great way to learn how to do some of the more advanced editor scripting stuff. Because what you can see is you can see how the hierarchy window is drawn, which I think is pretty cool, which then means you can make your own hierarchy window. It's a bit tough. You can't just copy the code and run it. 
but the possibilities are just endless. Uh, and then at the last year's talk, Sean White, after saying, through the magic of reflection, you can do anything, he did say something like, oh, if you use reflection in your editor tools and then we make the t tiniest change, it'll break horribly, but that's just naysaying, you know? Shouldn't stop us from doing what we want to do. Okay, so here's the Unity Editor assembly. I'd already brought it in. When you launch this thing, it won't be there, so you just need to drag it in or do open something. We go into the Unity Editor namespace and then find Asset Store Window. And this is just, there's just so many classes here that I feel like when I first did this thing, I felt like a kid in a candy shop. You could just go into anything and, and double click it. Hierarchy Window, we were just talking about it. And uh, that, that's how the Hierarchy Window is drawn. No? <laughs> okay, well. There's apparently another class that handles that, uh, but we can find it, no problem. Actually, it draws from base project window, and all it does is set the hierarchy type of stuff that's drawn as game object. So if you can right-click on this guy and go to declaration, this is a big one. So you can see how the base project window that actually uh, powers both the hierarchy view and the project view is done. And this is a bit more verbose than probably the actual code because it's being decompiled and there are a couple of quirks that get in there through the decompilation process. But it, it's huge, it's huge. If you saw the ongoing on this thing, it would, you would go crazy. Uh, so let's just go back to our original goal, which is uh, making a web browser. So asset store window. There it is. Okay. And I love this, some of you might have seen this. Implements the interface icon has custom menu. It's lovely. Um, so here's the code for it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and copy it um, and create a new C sharp class. Again, like I said, I'm not the fastest at typing right now. Apologize for that. Uh, well, Close without saving, sure. OK, copy it over. First things first, we've got to get rid of, I don't like this namespace. We don't need it. We're not in that namespace anyways. Let's get rid of that. This is going to be a very like, prudent and, and like, um, change kind of process. So change the class to be public. Derive from editor window. We don't need icon has custom menu. And then if we are still good, then let's just format this. OK. So if I just change the name of this class to match the file name that I have and go back to Unity, I wonder what will happen. Go to the console. Uh, OK. So we're going we're gonna to keep doing this. We're going to alt tab back to Unity. We're going to get a bunch of errors. We're going to go in and fix them. It's going to be a lot of fun. So our constructor isn't the same name as our class. So let's fix that. And it says it doesn't know editor window, which means we haven't included the editor uh, Unity engine uh, assembly, or namespace, rather, Unity engine. Oh, sorry, editor. There we go. And then it says, I don't know web view. I don't know asset store context. What are these types? The problem is we can't access them. We can't just include a namespace and get a hold of the web view or the asset store context because those are internal to that assembly, right? So we're going to have to get them through the magic of reflection. That's the idea. So instead of saying this object is of type web view, we're going to need to say this object is just a system.object. And then we're going to have to handle all the type stuff and the custom method calls ourselves. Asset store context. Well, we don't really want the asset store part of this thing, so we're going to throw this away. So just delete this. See if there are any other instances of this thing being used. OK, create context object. No, we don't need that. Uh, remove it. Set context object, remove it. Just throw away anything we don't need. And a web script object. Let's assume we don't need this as well. I'm just going to comment this out. Uh, is it being used anywhere? Nope. Go back. And then what is asset store window, it says? Uh, we'll just say this is web window. Let's see if there are any other instances of asset store window. OK, there are quite a few. Let's just replace them wholesale to web window. OK, now we're going to get a bunch more errors. All this unusable, unreachable code stuff is from the other stuff I showed you, so that's no problem. 
um, there's some resolution stuff here. Um, I don't want to worry about this. I'm just going to set it to some fixed size. So I'm going to get rid of all the resolution stuff. Uh, this is the, all this constructor does is just set the resolution. So we don't need them. We don't need a constructor anyway since we have an editor window and we're just going to bring it up through a menu item, right? OK, so resolution. Uh, it's used here. These guys use it. These guys use it. Size, 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 gone. Saved cursor, don't need it. OK, and there's set cursor here that we don't need, so we get rid of this. Go back. Every time, Unity will throw more errors at you. You just, don't, you just don't give up, and you keep going until it works. Context object, don't need it. It says boxed one, can't find. Setting value type to boxed, and then setting it here. So you're just setting this to true, OK? This is a decompilation little quirk, so we get rid of that. And then I don't, it says, see, this is lovely. It says editor window dot docked is inaccessible due to its protection level. So they don't want to give us access to this docked property, which is just wrong. So we can get access to it easily, but I don't want to care about this thing being docked, so let's skip that. Uh, skin index, don't need it. It says, I don't know what web view is. So this is the part where we start to do some reflection. So first thing we want to do is we want to include the reflection namespace, so system.reflection, OK? And then we go web view. And this is actually, this part is the most critical uh, part of this thing is initializing the web view, which is the part that actually draws the website, um, web page part of this thing. So init web view, um, what they do is they create a scriptable object, create an instance web view, and they pass it a type. And now we can't, we don't have this type, right? But luckily there's an override of create instance that takes a system.type value for this. So if you look at the overloads for this guy, we have, you can just pass it a, it's a generic version where you can pass the actual type by name, or you could pass the system like type value, or you could pass the class name. So we'll just do, um, we could just do, dot, um, I think, web view like this, um, and that might work. But we can't cast the web view, we can't just say web view because that type is unknown. So we gotta get rid of that one. And this dot web view is that, and web view is that. I think this is a decompilation thing again. There's no need for that second variable. So let's get rid of that. OK. And this can be just this, that web view. This, that web view. Good, good, good. OK. OK. And there's another duct here. Let's get rid of that one. And then it says we can't call get with on the rect. Um, let's see where this is used. OK. So all that's happening is from the position one rectangle, uh, we're just getting the width. So again, this is the decompiler being a little stupid. So we get uh, position one dot width, OK. And then the height is gotten from position two dot, OK, height, great. So we can get rid of these guys. OK. This dot web view init web view. So we're calling we have a method called init web view. We're calling init web view on the web view itself as well. So to be able to call that method on a type that we don't know about, uh, we're finally going to use some reflection. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a hold of the web view type. And the way to do that, I don't remember. How do we do that? Uh, oh. System reflection. Anyone remember how to do that? I could cheat and look at my code, but uh, dot assembly. I think we do dot assembly dot get type or something. So if we get an assembly, um, let's just say type of editor window, and then get type with a string. Here we go. I think this should do it. I'm not 100 percent sure. We'll see. Web view type. OK? Anyone think I'm doing anything horribly wrong? No? OK. Let's keep going. Um, so we got the web view type to call a method that we don't have access to. Here's what we do we say type dot get method. And it wants, it'll ask us some stuff like what's the method name that you're looking for. And we'll say it's init web view. OK? And then uh, it'll want, it says what types of. Um, 
arguments is method one. So we need to give it that. So we create a new type array. And we say, well, it gets a float and a float and a bool. OK. And then some parameter modifiers. I don't think we need those. What we really need, I think, is the binding flags, which uh, let us tell the reflection system, well, I want to get access to the static method or this private method. So that's what we need to do. Uh, so binding flags dot private. Uh, is there a private? There's public, static, et cetera. OK. In this case, I am going to cheat a little bit because the binding flags, um, there's a specific combination that I really need. OK, here it is, full binding. Static, instance, non-public, public. I want everything. That's the idea. OK. And then we just pass it the full binding that we just copied over. And I think that should be fine. So once you've gotten the method, now we can actually invoke it. Uh, but I think I might have some problems with my list of arguments, so let's take a look. Not getting any autocomplete, which is great. Let's just let Unity give us the error. OK. Full binding. Anyone see what, what uh, mistake I'm making here? No, oh, I guess. OK, it works. So I can invoke it. Hang on, it doesn't work. So we pass the string, we pass the array, and we pass it that, and we close that. And we do that. Sorry? Typo. Where do you guys see the typo? OK, yes, absolutely. Thank you. So we need type of float to get those types. Beautiful. OK, now we can call dot invoke on it. And invoke will want an object to actually invoke this method on, which is our web view object. And then it'll want some objects to pass to it, which are going to be these values that we want to pass. So we create a new object array. And then we pass those values position 1.width, position 2.height, and num is not equal to 0. And that's how we invoke it. So this is the reflection equivalent of making this call. If we had access to this method, we could just call it. We can't. So this is what we do with reflection. That's the idea. We get the type. We get its method. We get the pass the prop, uh, parameters. And we're good. And we still have a bunch of errors. So what I'm going to do, this could take a while. Uh, and we don't have that much time. I'm going to show it to you in action. Um, so let's just open up the finished version. Come on. I think MonoDevelop wants to crash. Do any questions in the meanwhile? Yes. Uh, the question I think is, isn't the compiling these DLLs against the user end user license agreement? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> The thing is, I, I won't name anyone, but I heard from an engineer yesterday that the fact that it violates licensing agreement is stupid because they keep telling us that it's fine to do it. So you're probably not going to get put in prison. I mean, I'm betting for that case, so I think we'll be fine. Yeah, MonoDevelop is dead. Let's just force quit it. And um, let's just copy this behind MonoDevelop's back so it doesn't complain again when we want to do this thing. So web window. Come here, Unite Assets Editor, and just paste it in there. And the final working code is actually shorter than what we were working with. We just had to basically, all, all I did, if we just kept going, is that replace any instance of a method or a type that you, don't, you, you can't know about because it's private with a call to reflection that gives you that type and that method and just make those calls through reflection. It's really easy. OK, so we have web window. Let's try to bring it up. OK, here it is. So we went to DuckDuckGo. That was the home URL. And then we can just do some t search around here. Unite 12, 
Yay. So now we have a web browser inside of Unity. One problem is that we had added a URL bar here. Uh, but because this web view has, uh, has the focus, and I didn't write the code to take the focus away from it, which in a previous version I did, but that kept crashing, uh, I can't edit the URL right now. But it's totally doable. You just got to find how to hack it, and then you can edit the URL and type google.com. Even though I can select it, if I type goo, it just doesn't take. Uh, and then you can go to any website you want. So there you go. A uh, great way to decrease productivity in the editor. And um, finally, I think we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I want to go to questions real, uh, right after, but I want to show you this thing, which is just, again, for fun, we did the presentation as an editor window inside of Unity. That was really uh, not that complicated as well. Let's take a look. It's called Advanced Editor Scripting. And uh, I have a path to a text file, and I have a horrible file format. And uh, these are my slides right here. And the little S colon says this is a small text. As you can see, the lower text is smaller. And then after the uh, semicolon, if there is any text, that means call this method on, your, uh, on, on the class. I have a bunch of stuff here. So whenever I clicked this button that said call method, that you know, go, went ahead and selected that source textures thing, I was actually doing something like um, load asset at path, set it as the active selected object, and then ping it to do that ping uh, thing. That's it, yeah. Really simple. That's the talk. Let's move on to questions. Well, first of all, thank you for all this. This was very interesting. Um, Thanks. Could we get access to those scripts that you were talking about? But because you covered so much of very interesting things, and it's difficult to catch up with everything and remember. Do you have access to that? Or can we have access to this? To the scripts that I showed? Yeah, some okay. of it at least. Sure. I think all of them I can just put up on a zip file and just give it to you. That would um, be great. They are not production ready. So I only no, 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 no. wrote I'm not them. Expecting that. No, no, I understand, yeah. But I'm just giving you like a heads up that I just wrote them for myself or maybe one other person. Uh, so you're going to find a lot of issues with it. But I'll definitely put it up so it might be good learning material. Yes, um, learning material. As, as for how to get that to you, um, last slide has my Twitter handle. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, in, in a couple of days, you'll see a tweet from me saying, here, here are the files. Feel free, go nuts. Thank you. OK, sure. Any other questions? We never seem to be able to control that top bar where there is a, a play control and you know the layers and presentation. Can we have access to that? Sorry, because there is so much space there that we don't use. Oh, this area? Yeah. You want to get rid of it? No, I want to put stuff in it. Oh, you want to put stuff there? Um, you probably can. Um, I wonder if I have this thing here. Give me one second. I think I still have a few minutes. Maybe. Uh, hold on. OK. So I wrote this a while back um, just to be able to examine the UI of this editor um, live. So what it does is it just uses reflection. And it starts with itself. And it just exposes all the fields and properties that it has as a class. But this editor window belongs to um, a parent object. And then that belongs to? That has some children. If I can find, OK, this M parent. OK, it, it belongs to a parent, which is a dock area. And if we keep going up, we'll eventually get to the main window. And from there, we can get to this part that we can't draw over, right? And we can figure out who's responsible for drawing it and just you know, do whatever we want with it. 
Um, I wonder if we can get to it now. So we went to the parent, and I don't see another parent here. This is split view, which has a window, which then has the main view. Well, no, that's a split view. Um, edges, all windows. That's beautiful. Uh, it has a couple container windows. You could go nuts. I can't find it now, but yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I don't think there are any other questions. Thank you.